Please note that we are recording the session and we'll be sharing the link with all who registered. Please feel free to share that link with anyone whom you might think would be interested. Past recordings, registration for current offerings, and others can be found at our college website. Just search for College Connections. Today's College Connections topic is the state of Pennsylvania agriculture. And I'm delighted to, that I'm being joined here today by Secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, Russell Redding. After opening remarks, we will have a question and answer session. Many of you submitted questions with your registration process and we'll aim to get to those first. Also, but please feel free to enter additional questions at any time during the webinar, but using the Zoom Q&A link rather than the chat link, as it is easier for us to track the questions and make sure that we answer them. We hope to address your questions in our opening remarks or during the Q&A. So with that, let's get right to it. I'd like to welcome Secretary Redding. Governor Tom Wolf nominated Russell Redding to serve as the 26th Secretary of Agriculture of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in January 2015 and was confirmed by the Senate in May 2015. He's a former Dean of the School of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences at Delaware Valley College and has extensive experience as a public servant, having spent more than 20 years serving Pennsylvania in Harrisburg and Washington, DC. But more importantly, he's a graduate of our college with a BS in agricultural education and an MS in agriculture and extension education. In addition, he's a graduate of the Agribusiness Executive Program. Secretary Redding, over to you. Dean Ralph, thank you and uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm never nervous until I hear the introduction, <laughs> right? Uh, very kind, uh, thanks for reminding me sort of where I started in the journey, uh, but uh, I appreciate you noting my affiliation with Penn State and, and still count that as one of those uh, you know, early, early uh, life lessons of opportunity uh, that I had and uh, what I've learned along the journey with you and, and others uh, in the College of Ag, but um, uh, very proud to work with you. Uh, everything that we do in the Department of Agriculture uh, is in full partnership with our land grant university in Penn State. I'm very, very proud of that and want to take this moment here in, uh, early in 2022 to say thanks. Uh, we, we, I think, come through a time uh, through COVID where, uh, I don't know about you, but it's, uh, you, you rush from one thing to the other and, and all of a sudden you look up and realize there are a lot of people who make what you do possible and have contributed significantly to our progress in agriculture and, and certainly you, Dean, and the College of Agricultural Sciences and Extension team and researchers are a significant piece of that. So I want to make sure that I say thank you to you and, and, and all. Uh, as we look at uh, you know, the farm show in the rear view mirror, uh, we just came through that and very proud of, of the show. It was good to be back and live and uh, reconnecting again uh, with, with uh, so many, both in the agricultural community, but also those who depend on what it is that we do and how we do what we do. Um, it's, it's good to, to have this conversation. Many, many things as we learned during that week uh, are of concern, uh, public interest uh, about agriculture and the industry. So uh, I feel like uh, the questions that we'll, we'll have today and an opportunity to engage is in that uh, in that theme. Um, so I want to make sure that we, we uh, celebrate agriculture as we did uh, last week during Farm Show, but also uh, recognize agriculture's importance to, uh, to the economy of Pennsylvania. Um, to, uh, uh, to all in, who made the Farm Show uh, possible, uh, thank you for that. Uh, we had a theme of harvesting more and uh, certainly appropriate for today as we look at how do we continue to you know, manage the soil and uh, a growing population and educate our youth and each other and, and certainly uh, make sure that every harvest brings more to those who reap it um, and those who benefit from it. So I uh, look forward to the conversation today and the engagement with you both in the state of agriculture, but the, re the connections as, as this uh, uh, platform is, is noted. Uh, look forward to, to talking about where agriculture is. Uh, I'll just at the outset say that you know, I am incredibly grateful you know, for an industry that uh, I think is rediscovered in so many ways over this uh, COVID, um, rediscovered for what it offers in terms of, of daily existence, but also rediscovered in terms of uh, the 
uh, open space, the natural resources that we're managing, um, the jobs that we create, the economic activity, uh, all of that I think is, is uh, newly appreciated. Uh, that's what I took away uh, over the last two years, but particularly last week. Uh, and to the agricultural community who uh, work with us to ensure that um, happens and continues. Uh, a note of thanks to all of, all of you. Um, but my final point is that you know, the expectations on agriculture continue to grow. I mean, I, I don't, it, it feels, I feel more pressure in so many ways uh, for what is happening, uh, where it's happening, how it's happening, the role that we have as, as uh, Department of Agriculture and as administration, but also the opportunities that we have. Uh, I, I, I'm refreshed by the conversations and the vision and passion that the agricultural community uh, have expressed to us about what they see, but also the public's appreciation uh, with an equal measure of expectation on us. I'm, I'm energized by that as well, because I, I see that as a great opportunity for us to tell our story about what Penn State does, what the College of Agriculture, Science, and, uh, and the Department of Agriculture can do. So with that, Dean, uh, thank you and look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Secretary. And um, I'm very grateful for thanks, but right back at you. I mean, it's been great to work with the department in so many ways. Uh, um, as many people know, I've been working very, very closely with the department on spotted lanternfly, which has given me a real chance to interact with a lot of your rank and file staff. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, I just wanted to observe that Pennsylvania agriculture remains strong, um, but as Secretary Redding has just alluded to, the last few years have highlighted we've got major challenges that we need to try to, um, to address to secure Pennsylvania's um, future, including in vibrant um, employment and a healthy environment. So we meet, as, as Secretary Redding has pointed out, on the heels of the farm show and also on Friday, the 2021 Rural Policy Summit, um, which featured Pennsylvania government leaders, including Secretary Redding. The recording for that will appear soon at the website for the Center for Rural Pennsylvania. That's the Center for Rural Pennsylvania. And I thank Kyle Kopko for um, making a preview available to me. So first to the most important feature of our agriculture, the people, industrious and creative. That's really what drives our, our strength. And yet we know that we've had real challenges with workforce that have been exposed by COVID. From a 2017 agricultural census, the average age of our farmers is about 51 years old, and that continues to have run true for the last 40 years I've been involved in agriculture, both here in Australia. 11% um, here are veterans, 10% are relatively new to farming. That is less than five years, and about 20, 21% of the farmers are women. Off-farm income is common, and perhaps essential for many or most of our farmers. There's just over 300,000 direct jobs in Pennsylvania with the top sectors being forestry processing, landscaping and food manufacturing, of which landscape management is often overlooked as a multi-billion dollar industry and associated with us. The top three farm operations are milk, poultry and eggs. And in 2020, the Department of Agriculture and Team Pennsylvania found that conducted a uh, Team Pennsylvania Foundation conducted a survey and found that the three top areas of concern were labor supply with 48% of the respondents. And it's probably gotten worse over the last couple of years. Um, environmental regulations at 30% and land availability at 28%. So those lay out some of the big challenges we have. For years, Pennsylvania has noted a labor, labor and workforce issues uh, that are the number one concern. And COVID has certainly worsened the situation. Um, you're all aware that more than 20 million people have quit their jobs in the second half of 2021. People have quit a grand resignation, and agriculture certainly has not been immune from that. Many companies have increased wages to attract workers, but workers have new expectations of what a flexible workplace will look like. 48% of all uh, U.S. employees from home work, worked at home for at least uh, part of the time, and nine out of 10 want to remain remote. So um, this probably comes as a little surprise to any of you. A focus of Penn State has long been delivering workforce training, now remotely. And one of the big cha challenges that ag faces is that we often need people who can't work, work, work remotely. So we need more young people in agriculture. And the college runs a 4-H program that has been typically involved 90,000 youth across the state. Um, the Future Farmers of America are, are aligned with the Department of Agriculture, but we all swap back and forth. And, 
try to help each other in supporting those. Still, it's pretty clear that we need to reach out to communities that have not historically been very engaged in agriculture if we're gonna meet the workforce needs of the future. So highlighted in the, um, the meeting last Friday included mechanization as being a big challenge. Um, and the college is heavily involved in research on looking at mechanization for pr pruning, harvesting fruit and mushrooms, but also um, private industry across the world has really entered in this in a big way in looking at robotic milking to try to address large workforce needs in one of our primary industries and something that we probably need to consider more about. Also, the session last week identified broadband ask, access as a huge thing, and, and um, it's been a major aim for Extension to assist with this. Harry Christie and Tom Vriesnack developed last year an interactive broadband map tool to assist service providers bid for funding from the Federal Communications Commission, and that resulted in, and they were successful in $368 million of federal assistance to come and that, that'll be a big boost in rural areas, particularly to access new technologies that people are very much interested in, such as augmented reality and so forth. Um, further highlighted last Friday was climate change, particularly to extreme weather events like drought, rain and hurricanes. It's probably not so apparent yet in Pennsylvania, but it certainly is elsewhere. California seems to be in the worst drought in 800 years. I grew up there and worked in California agriculture for over a decade. I have to say, I never imagined that we'd see 10% of California's redwoods killed in, by fires in just one year. It's really, there's a, something else, there's something really going on out there. College researchers are embracing climate smart agriculture and forestry systems. We're working toward balanced and integrated solutions to effectively reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture production, while, while also increasing resilience and adaptability from both volatile and enduring environmental shifts. I think we in Pennsylvania have an opportunity, perhaps even an obligation, to, for increased food production in the face of increased temperatures and drought in other parts of the country and beyond. Particularly as climate change increases heat stress in the southern United States and into Latin America, we have the opportunity to try to promote extending, expanding animal agriculture in western Pennsylvania to avoid having an increase in density in the eastern part of the states where it is at risk for animal welfare, such as avian flu, and also intensifies the problems with disposal of waste. But on the western side of the state, the nutrients could be a real advantage for soil improvement, and it could be a real growth opportunity for supporting increased production of feed for livestock. Further, particularly as climate change, drought driven drought continues to reduce production in California and Arizona, especially in the summer, I think we need to, to try to plan to move toward increased fruit and vegetable production in Pennsylvania. And I can imagine vegetable production in Pennsylvania increasing, particularly in the southeastern part of the state and along the microclimate zones, such as near Lake Erie. One of the reasons California was so strong in agriculture for such a long time is that there was an element of planning often driven by water projects. So I don't think that this will just happen if we don't wrap our hands around it. It will require planning and strategic analysis to really do this well. But I think the opportunities, and as I say, the obligation for Pennsylvania are quite large. So Pennsylvania agriculture is strong, but we have many challenges and opportunities immediately into the future. And I look forward to working with you to get onto the job of addressing them. So with that, I just wanna remind people that we'll open things up for the Q&A session. Um, thanks for the questions the audience has submitted in advance. And please feel free to enter any questions you have in the Q&A link and we'll take them from there. But I'll start off by looking at through, using the questions that were submitted um, before, uh, during registration. So one of the questions was, I know quantity of food is important, but is the Department of Ag going to put increased attention and resources toward organic growing methods? And I thought it's Department of Ag, so Kerry, I'll hand that one to you. The short answer is yes. Uh, and, and I hope that the um, individual who, who surfaced the question uh, sort of sees the changes that, that we have made. Um, I think it's both uh, you know, in the question that the quantity of food uh, is, is clearly a part of it, uh, but I see organic production as part of that quantity of food production, right? So not, not to treat these sort of uh, separately. Uh, so we have been very intentional about uh, continuing support for organic as part of our Pennsylvania Farm Bill. Uh, it is, uh, yeah, it's the, uh, uh, you know, what we're seeing 
here in, in terms of response uh, and interest to, to what we're doing. Uh, we're, we're third in the U.S. in uh, organic sales uh, now, uh, which I think is, is a, uh, an impressive number and it continues to grow. We're at 745 million, roughly, obviously Oregon and California are in the first positions. Um, but we're seeing real results in, in the work that we're doing with Rodale Institute. Uh, particularly proud of that because I think it's the it's making sure that that we have transition assistance available. Uh, they have since we started the organics um, uh, consultancy program, uh, thirteen hundred and eighteen acres, I think, twenty five farms, one hundred and sixty two farmers are actually right now in that transition period, about 8,500 acres. So uh, yes, um, we are continuing to support organic. Um, see great uh, growth opportunity in that introductory comments, Dean, I think some of that indoor agriculture in the CEA uh, production environment that we have here in the state lends itself to some of the organic production, but um, pleased to, to see Pennsylvania continuing to support it. Uh, in addition to the USDA support that they provide to us, and we in turn provide via the Organic Certification Cost Share Program as one example. Um, uh, but a lot of a lot of work there. Uh, final point would be if uh, folks who are uh, in that business or want to be in that business have suggestions about what more we can do, by all means, tell us, uh, show us uh, what, what we can do, okay? Thank you, Secretary. So, um, the next question was, and again, I'm handing this one for you, does the ARP and other recent congressional bills, infrastructure, et cetera, support agriculture in Pennsylvania? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, and I think the, uh, you know, the, the um, American Rescue Plan funding uh, and the infrastructure bill and the other congressional actions, uh, I, I'd like to say that we are we are where we are because of the significant congressional investments, you know, over the, uh, the over the uh, last two years have allowed uh, Pennsylvania and, and, and I think each of us as citizens, but certainly as an industry, agriculture to uh, be where we are. Um, I, I, I would hate to to see what uh, what our economy would look like and the industry would look like without that type of federal investment. So. Uh, very appreciative of that. Uh, in both cases, the American Rescue Plan and the bipartisan infrastructure bill are multi-year investments. So uh, infrastructure, as an example, is for a five-year commitment. Uh, the American Rescue Plan funding is at least through 2024. So think about this both in terms of how we've already benefited, but um, part of it is also what needs to be done um, yet. And I say that knowing that uh, our legislation and governor will uh, be in those conversations about how to allocate some of the uh, American Rescue Plan and infrastructure monies as well. Uh, I would just ask for, you know, uh, each of you to use your voice. May the things that you think we need to invest in, uh, please express those to members of the House and the Senate and to, to us and the governor's office as well. Um, because I think there's opportunities inside both both of those. Uh, and I like to point particularly to the infrastructure bill, because I think there's, you mentioned broadband um, as one of the areas that there's been some significant developments in the last uh, month or so with the new authority established. But I don't think there's a single topic that's more transformative to, um, you know, to, to Pennsylvanians, America, but certainly Pennsylvanians uh, that came out of, out of the pandemic and the broadband and access and connectivity. Um, so I'm pleased to see uh, monies in the infrastructure bill for that. There's resources in the infrastructure package for um, pollinator uh, practices. There's invasive species money. Uh, there's research in rural energy and innovation. There's carbon components to it. So the list goes on uh, and certainly would encourage you to um, take a look at those packages uh, and what's there. Number two, uh, if you've got thoughts about what the needs are uh, please uh, raise those up for us, okay? Thanks, Secretary. So, so folks, you heard it here first. The next question was, in the next 30 years, how will global warming affect the types of crops that we were able to grow in Pennsylvania? And what preparations are we making to adjust what the farmers grow to this new reality? So I've touched on some, some of our, our, our own thoughts about this in the college. Um, in terms of what are the kinds of, what how will global warming affect things? What the predictions are is that 
it will get warmer. It will also have more extreme temperatures. So from time to time, you'll get, you, we could still expect very strong cold snaps. We probably, some increases in rainfall are possible, but we also probably will get much more influence from hurricanes into the future than we've had in the past. And we're acutely aware of some of those major rainfall events. So things like that, that we have to be prepared for um, in, in urban, suburban areas, as well as agriculture moving forward. But, uh, but a lot of what we can expect is crops that are, um, that where Pennsylvania was previously too cold to grow, we'll be able to grow some. And as I said, I think that we'll find that increasing heat stress in place like, well, in Southern US and into Latin America will, um, will mean that their productivity will decline. And it's a real opportunity for Pennsylvania with our, um, with our crops and so forth to be able to do more in that area, particularly if we develop in, in new areas of Pennsylvania. But Secretary, I'm sure the department has a lot on going for this as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I think the, this whole global warming discussion, um, I find fascinating because uh, you know, there's a lot of political tensions around it. And, and to me, it's, there's not an industry with a more intimate relationship with the climate than agriculture. So it is something we, we do take seriously. We've got to have a strong voice in what that uh, climate policies look like. I think agriculture is on the front line of impact, but it's also the front line of the opportunities. And, and how we approach it, I think, is really critical. Uh, we have uh, concern, um, you know, about the impacts of, of climate for sure. When you look at, you know, 60% of all human diseases and 75% of the emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic, right? And so if you, if you just took that one dimension, I know the question is specific to crops, but given what we're confronting relative to spotted lanternfly and make your list of invasives, uh, they are things that are climate related, right? They're climate uh, you know, generated in so many ways. So I, I, I look at that whole concern, particularly in the context of COVID, what we've all experienced as a major, uh, major issue uh, that is, was a concern and is sort of exacerbated now as a result of uh, some of the climate, uh, 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 climate concerns. But as we approach uh, you know, climate, I think there are two two elements. One is sort of the uh, look at the adaptation, you know, to what extent we can adapt to, uh, and then the mitigation. Right? There's two really important differences between how we adapt and then what we mitigate. Um, but I think again, agriculture has a role. Specific to crops, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, uh, crop crop by variety uh, necessarily, but uh, the all studies are it's hotter and it's wetter, and the the wet components are not when maybe we would prefer to them be wet. <laughs> so it, it's how do we address that? Part of it is uh, what we do to manage the risk, um, you know, the, you know, both in terms of crop insurance, uh, in terms of uh, indoor agriculture, in, in terms of coverage of diversification of crops. Um, I live in Adams County and, and marvel at the uh, diversity of varieties that we have today and some of those not too many years ago were simply in the south right there were other parts of the world even uh, and now they're in adams county so it tells me that that world is changing um, both in uh, for the positive where there's opportunity but also you know the challenges with uh, disease and risk um, are also part of that climate change um, so uh, the, the preparation piece of the question i think is you know, trying to make sure that we're advocating for uh, the right policies, making sure that we are not shying away from discussions about implications for us. We are an animal agriculture state. Uh, how we manage that and, and navigate through the through the um, uh, global warming discussions relative to animal production, I think, is critical for us. And and you look out over the next fifty years, uh, it's warmer, so those animals that are uh, that are confined. In, in animal feeding operations and or land-based that are, you know, um, uh, ruminants uh, are gonna be implicated, right? So how do we manage that? So that is top of mind for us and I appreciate the question. And again, would just ask for, for active uh, engagement around this question of climate. Um, and final would be that I always think of climate as it's climate and, right? It's climate and food production, it's climate and research, it's climate and human health. And I think the and piece for me, every time I say it, helps me understand the placement of the, of the issue, 
right? It's not in one dimension. It's not like we've got a Bureau of Climate Change, right? We've got a Bureau of Animal Health that has climate concern. It's our Bureau of Markets and uh, the same with the college. So uh, thank you. Thanks, Secretary. The next question is, please discuss upcoming grant opportunities for urban agriculture in our state. What are the current plans, if any, to get BIPOC communities involved in the various sectors of agriculture across the state? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Uh, I'll just yeah. say that, that uh, you know, again, the Farm Bill, Pennsylvania Farm Bill, um, uh, really important, you know, governor sort of launched uh, based on the findings of the economic impact study we did. Uh, and then that became sort of a, a bipartisan, bicameral piece of legislation, many pieces of legislation. Uh, the one that I'm most proud of inside of the Farm Bill is the urban agriculture. And uh, the, Dean, you've heard me say this, that, you know, there, you know prior to uh, the urban ag um, uh, you know, grant, uh, infrastructure grant program, we could go to urban centers and we could acknowledge what uh, folks were doing and the creative, innovative work that were being done, but we couldn't invest in it. And now, you know, uh, as a result of the Farm Bill, you know, we're three years in, we've made a million and a half uh, dollar investment um, uh, in, in those uh, in those areas. There's a couple that stand out. One is in CMAC in Philadelphia, in an area of about 10 square blocks in, in uh, Southeast Philadelphia, 25 different languages uh, spoken, Asian languages spoken, you know, doing urban agriculture and they are as proud as the, of the work they're doing uh, in that community and those gardens as, as I am in my fields of Adams County. In the Pittsburgh, you know, we've seen so many traditional African foods and, you know, work being done and, and millet flowers. Uh, uh, I can take you around the state, but in every case, I think the urban centers uh, are, are doing great work. I'm just proud that we can finally recognize some of that work and invest in that work. Uh, and in every case, uh, they are communities of color. And um, I think we're, we're pleased to, to see that uh, work being done and count them as part of our uh, agricultural community. I'll just put a footnote to that as I think as we look at the number of farms and that's sort of a theme throughout uh, even our discussions last week at Farm Show, how we count agriculture, who is and what is agriculture, I think continues to evolve and making sure that we are being uh, inclusive um, and, uh, and recognize that diversity that we all speak of within agriculture is really, really important. In addition, you know, making sure that we are working with manners, right? The, uh, the manners, we have a project just here I'm sorry, it seems we've lost Secretary Redding for a few minutes. He was referring to the uh, Manners programs, which um, addresses uh, young people getting engaged in agriculture. Um, I, I would add that uh, the college is very much engaged in this in various ways, in particular, um, trying putting a high emphasis on developing Spanish language outreach and education wherever we can. Um, a huge proportion of our agricultural work workforce are native Spanish speakers. But we're um, also trying to work as closely as we can with state and federal agencies across the board. I know from mutual acquaintances that um, USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack is very interested in trying to have stronger outreach, particularly to black populations. And um, we're trying to figure out ways of engaging with that as well. So um, just moving on, the next question that was asked was, how are extension educators staying relevant? There we are, Secretary Redding. Sort of lost you there for a minute. You, you want to um, pick up your thread? Yeah, don't don't take it personally. I'm not sure where I uh, uh, <laughs> where I left off. Um, but uh, you were talking about I, manners. You had introduced manners. Oh, yeah, yeah. So just to say, in addition to you know the the farm bill and the investments that we're making through the farm bill, uh, I think it's also important just uh, you know to support the you know, communities through professional development, right? Through manners is one one such organization, uh, but we also have a, an internal project just here to make sure that as we look at our responsibilities to include and engage the uh, agricultural community at large, particularly urban centers, uh, is that we're also living that ourselves, right? The diversity is here in the professional work that we do and our programming and respect for 
uh, all positions and, and everybody, regardless of where they are in life's journey, uh, is respected. So thank you. Thanks, Secretary. So I, I started to move on about the next question, which was uh, extension educators staying relevant with evolving technologies, growing straight to large operations for the manufacturers. And I think it's important to know that this has not been a challenge, just a recent challenge for at least 40 or 50 years. This has been the case. Um, a prime example is the um, development of various pesticides, which was largely done by uh, large organizations that had the financial reserves. There, wasn't, there weren't many that were discovered or developed in university settings, but university researchers have played a huge role in identifying how to best use pesticides and also um, a, a raising concerns about the problems that are associated with them and how to address them. And similarly, when new technology comes out now, we, we play, still play a major role in evaluating what's the best way to integrate the technology and trying to make sure that the claims made for the technology are justified by the performance. So we do that as, as a part of a top 25 research organization. Um, we have access to world renowned researchers within the university and, and collaborating universities. And so we have a, a very robust strategy to in, engage government, industry, and non-NGOs to do these things. So and we, we still have this continuing drive to integrate um, operations from development through actual practic uh, practical application in the field. So um, the technologies are going maybe more or less straight to large producers, but with a lot of, there's still a lot of engagement with um, researchers in extension. So secretary, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I would say you know, relevancy is, uh, you know, there are several dimensions to relevancy, right? One, one is, I think the, uh, as the question sort of points here, the educators and their relationship with um, uh, some of the larger operations. And certainly that, you know, to me, uh, the role of extension and the educators is even more relevant when that dynamic occurs than maybe before. Why? Uh, because I think the, the fundamentals of what the public uh, expects in terms of food safety, in terms of animal care, in, uh, in terms of you know climate and some of the things we've touched on here today, uh, you still need somebody in uh, that uh, you know non-biased role as a land grant institution to help translate. I think the benefits of whatever those technologies are that are being applied uh, and and their implication for society, because it's it's it unlike the private sector that has. Uh, the business relationship and, and you know, can establish that one-on-one. -on -one. I think for us, uh, land-grant university and the Department of Agriculture, there are multiple beneficiaries of that work, right? And making sure that we're thinking about as educators and as department, where and who else needs to be engaged in conversations uh, uh, you know, regarding these technologies. And I think that's a piece for me. I'm always in the back of my mind making sure that we uh, were mindful of that, that it's a legislature understanding it, it's the public uh, interests, uh, it's the farm and the business owner. So to me, relevant, um, relevance key, obviously, we wanna be relevant, we all wanna feel relevant, uh, right? Uh, and I think there's a lot of people in the last couple of years who wonder if, uh, you know, that, uh, if they are still relevant. I mean, I, I believe that uh, agriculture is, and, and what you do in the extension system and what we do in the department is even more relevant. It's a question of how we manage that um, and uh, making sure we're looking at the multiple beneficiaries. Agreed. So uh, the next question is about dairy farms and I, Secretary Reddy and I have had many conversations about this, including um, long car trips to Washington DC and back. So I know that he's ex extremely concerned about the state of the dairy industry. The next question is how many dairy farms will be lost in the next 10 years? Uh, and the answer is, <laughs> I, I think they, uh, I don't have a number. Uh, what, my, my response has been uh, a pretty good indicator is looking back 10 years, right? And then look forward. And we have the Center for Dairy Excellence and we do a lot of different things in support of dairy. Uh, I think the trend line of fewer farms uh, will continue, uh, but I think the same trends will uh, continue in terms of cow numbers, uh, the size of cows, the production increases, all of those are equally important trends. Um, 
And I think for, for each of us in this business of agriculture, you know, we have, uh, we, we're, we always sort of are concerned about when someone leaves the industry. And I think particularly when you see farms that generationally have been here and they've got to make a decision because of economic pressures. But to me, that's also what drives us, right? To find answers, to, to pull our policymakers together, to look at investments that we can make uh, as we did with the dairy investment program, why we fund the Center for Dairy Excellence, why it's important to have policies, uh, federal policies and engagement there. Um, so I, I think that the, uh, the trend of fewer dairy farms will continue but it's also um, offset, I think, by, um, you know, by, by the number of people who will, will uh, enter the business and um, find diversity. I, mean, I look at the, you know, the 77 projects we did in the Dairy Investment Program, and you know, every one of those 77 will tell you that they're in a different place and a better place as a result of the investments they've made, and quite frankly, taking some control of their destiny. Uh, adding some value, looking at herd size, looking at grazing options, looking at robotics. All of that is, is part of the dynamic of being in the dairy business. So uh, I'm still high on dairy. I think it's a great uh, piece of Pennsylvania and we're in the right place for diversification of agriculture generally, but also the dairy industry specifically. So thank you. Yeah, I, there's not much I can add to that, uh, except that we, I had personal experience with introducing robotic milking at farms while I was in Australia. And I think it's one of those things where you really, as, as things get tighter on the labor market, you really have to take a look at it. Um, um, Secretary, I, I've already weighed in on this a little bit, but what do you see as the most pressing challenging facing, challenge facing the ag industry in the next five years? Yeah, I, I've, uh, thank you. And I, I've, you know, shifted this answer around several times, uh, you know, moving from economics to, relationship to et cetera. Uh, but I come back to workforce. I um, mean, I've sort of settled on, you know, what uh, it, it was an issue pre-pandemic and now, you know, experiencing the last uh, two years and, and your, your framing front side about the number of people who have voluntarily left the workforce and the great resignation that agriculture is not exempt from uh, and the realization that uh, there are a lot of jobs inside of ag, but there are also a lot of tough jobs inside ag, and people are, are looking at it uh, and, and looking at opportunities. But workforce to me is like the biggest challenge. And I'll say several things. One is, I think for all of us uh, in ag, uh, the revelation of who is actually inside our production systems. Um, and doing really critical jobs that keep supply chain working from production to process and to distribution and retail and service sector, is that there are a lot of folks there who really uh, had, been, um, had been nameless, right? We, we didn't speak of them. We didn't talk a lot about uh, safety and their concern. Um, and, and now we know who they are. And I think that's really changed for me. Uh, this challenge is both um, acquiring talent, retaining talent, and protecting the talent, right? And that is, that is critical. I've been in too many of these processing plants where, you know, when, when the posting on the bulletin board has 13 different languages, right? There's a message in that. Is that there are people who are here doing really, really critical jobs and we need to represent them and, and make sure that they're part of our calculus as we talk about workforce um, so I think that's, a, that's an important part. Uh, secondly is I think we also, the game has changed to now being much more intentional about what those jobs are and who do we actually need in those jobs. And when I say those jobs, it's the full spectrum of you know, production processing and, and uh, you know, the scientists and, and managers, all of that. I think it's just be very intentional about it is that's gonna require a different setup to how we attract that talent. Um, and that may require, in addition to the degrees, uh, the apprenticeship model. And we're doing some of those now. We've got seven that we've started. I know Penn State, Dean, you're working on several as well uh, in that space, and thank you for that. And then the final point would be uh, to the intentionality is, and, and last week being a good test case, is that, there's still a perception of agriculture and the jobs that we offer 
uh, about what they are uh, and where they are. And uh, to be honest, it continues to be challenging because it's not reflective of the meaningful place of employment that agriculture provides. So it tells me we've got to do a much, much better job of educating and reaching into our classrooms and society to have those conversations about these are the kinds of jobs that are available. This is the type of pay. This is the type of you know, reward uh, in those jobs. Uh, and, and that's the piece, the takeaway for me is making sure that we do that um, and, and using the lens of, of COVID to remind us of that diversity of, of the jobs, but also making sure that we're plugged in fully to the uh, workforce development programs of our, our county and state and nation here. Yeah, I agree with you. There's one of the comments has been made on the chat. Are we truly to fully mechanize and industrialize farming? Have we given up on inviting new people into agriculture? And certainly we have not. And that's, a, that's a, Secretary Redding is alluding to that. It's a big aim of the college as well. Um, but we are you know, reflecting that there's some menial jobs that just people don't want to do. So we can get pruning done in orchards, which is usually at a, when it's cold and miserable outside and not particularly upskill labor. Uh, uh, or mechanical harvesting of mushrooms and so forth, which can be, is not particularly challenging either. What we think what we wanna do is introduce mechanization for the monotonous jobs and really um, create new industries for the people that's, that service those things and to upskill people. So they're instead of just doing straight menial things, um, they're working at a higher level of technology with better funding, better um, employment prospects and so forth and, and get away from just straight ma manual labor about it. Um, so we don't have free college programs for adults wanting to become farmers, but we have a lot of pretty free or close to free information for education um, through Penn State Extension. So that's something I'd encourage people to look at. So um, yeah, we, and we really do need to reach out to, to um, get more people involved. We did a study on this in Australia at one point and concluded that um, on case studies, it seemed like one of the most important things to get young people involved in farming was to make sure they had an, an experience on a very healthy, um, productive farm when they were young, some kind of a positive experience, not at a farm that's struggling, but where they could see what the future was for agriculture. And I, I think that's something we can all try to, to do more of that is, is a thought. Um, next question, and I know Secretary Redding, you're very interested in this as well. Um, what are some specific programs for veterans, which as you pointed out, are we were defended by one or 2% of the country and one or 2% of the country Grow food. Yeah, uh, right. I think there are so many similarities between sort of the the agriculture um, uh, agriculture and our military, and uh, you know you you can you can talk about the one to two percent, but you know when you're down into the single digits, uh, you know, feeding us and defending us. I mean, it's it's a special group of people, and I think we've got a, an opportunity. Uh, to do more together, to, to represent uh, what we do for uh, society. I think that's part of the story we need to tell. Uh, it's also worth noting that 40% of our military, active military, come from rural America, right? So they come out of our, our small towns across the, across the U.S. So uh, again, uh, a similarity to, to agriculture. The opportunities uh, specific to veterans. I mean, I think uh, we, we uh, have been interested in that uh, for a long time. You mentioned this uh, in part of the setup, the 11% uh, Pennsylvania, I think the number is uh, of veterans. Um, you know, we've got a lot of opportunity there to, uh, to recognize them for what they've done, but also take full advantage of the skills and competencies that they offer. And everything that they've done within the military is transferable to the ag, ag business sector. Um, we have worked uh, uh, within our PA preferred program, uh, Homegrown by Heroes, um, something we started a couple of years ago to recognize as a way to recognize uh, our veterans uh, within the PA preferred program, which is our state branding initiative. Homegrown by Heroes was started by uh, Kentucky um, uh, Department of Agriculture there and some partners, but we want to make sure that the marketplace is that we can uh, give recognition to, uh, to the veteran produced product. And, and we think that has great value, of course, to consumers uh, to know that. Uh, and to say that while we have specific 
uh, programs uh, focused on veterans and wanting, wanting to recognize them to include our own employees. It's also, uh, it's also important to note that within our Ag Business Development Center, all are welcome, right? And, and a lot of the things that we've done within the, uh, within the farm bill are uh, uh, available to, um, to veterans um, and all, all producers, whether that be the Farm Vitality Grants or PA Preferred or conservation programs. And then final, uh, I felt really strongly about this, that you know, for us to uh, recognize the veterans and work with them, we also have to sort of better understand them and was pleased to, uh, uh, to have uh, Dr. Scheinberg, Josh Scheinberg, who um, graduated Penn State, PhD in food, uh, food safety, food science, um, join us as the Eastern Region Director and, and has been really helpful on the meat and meat processing issues. Uh, but Josh uh, uh, is also our Veterans Coordinator and, and as a US Air Force veteran, uh, helping us sort of navigate both the uh, Call to service that they feel um, um, they want to do when, when they make the transition to civilian life, but also want to make sure that we're supporting them uh, through the department department programs. Thank you, Secretary. At uh, Penn State and the College of Ag, we're also very engaged with veterans. One of the programs we have is called the Clearinghouse for Military Family Readiness. This was uh, is a partnership with state and federal agencies, but our faculty member Daniel Perkins is a is a primary leader in this, and it's, it provides lots of um, resources for um, people in military service. So that's the clearinghouse for military family readiness. Um, moving on, um, Secretary, describe what options a farmer has in PA, for example, to grow crops and sell directly to consumers, grow crops and sell to wholesalers, etc. Yeah, where, where to begin? I mean, I, I think this is like, you know, at the very core of uh, when we say opportunity, um, I think this this is what it is, right? I think you're, all who are uh, interested in agriculture are welcome to agriculture. I mean, we are uh, the number one state in the nation uh, with the most producers under the age of 35. I mean, that's not a self-declaration. That is a U.S. Department of Agriculture assessment of, of state and average ages and uh, looking at those in the group of 35 and under. Uh, so it tells me that there's a lot of opportunity. Here. Um, I think the, uh, what you want to do is sort of endless and possibilities. You can do the direct market uh, and that can be to scale. You can do, I think with now on-farm uh, sales, uh, online sales with uh, uh, the extension of broadband and what that opens up. Uh, if you're on you know, the other side of that spectrum of you know, uh, livestock production. We've got uh, you know, a lot of opportunity here in the state. Crop production. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful time to be uh, in agriculture and thinking about food production. Uh, and that's before you get to some of these, uh, you know, some of the uh, urban discussion that we've had today. Some of the indoor agriculture, the controlled environment agriculture. Uh, when I look at the amount of investment that's being made in certain aspects of ag to include uh, the CEA and technology side, it tells me that there's a lot of public interest uh, in, in ag. So I'm excited about it. I, I know that's a general question, but uh, I would simply say that if there's an interest in ag, um, then there's an opportunity in ag, uh, an, an opportunity for you. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right, Secretary. And also, it, it's probably not, I think what we've learned from COVID, both in anecdotal case and, and real case studies, is that um, it's not a good idea to put all of your produce in one basket. And, and that a lot of successful pr producers that have navigated through COVID have, have had multiple options so that if their primary sales route didn't make it, um, so they'd have backup plans. And within the Penn State Extension website, there's a section dedicated to business and operations, and you can find that by searching at, at extension.psu.edu. Uh, I'll try to make a little note about that in the chat, but that the business and operations section um, can, has business plans, marketing strategies, transition, direct sales, online sales, and so forth that might help people address the broad scope of activities. Um, so um, one of the next questions is, 
what what ag tra trends can we look forward to in the post pandemic? Got some thoughts on that one, Secretary? Yeah, I think the you know I, I guess I don't see the developments that occurred during COVID reverting back, uh, meaning. I think our desire as as consumers for convenience will, will continue and continue to accelerate. Um, you know, we'll continue to be cautious. I think in terms of of um, you know shopping and, and you know we'll continue to desire you know curbside pickups and home delivery and uh, you know caution around eating out and salad bars and you know, all the things that you know have been changed as a result of, of COVID. Um, but the other trend I, I mentioned earlier, I think, relative to awareness of those who are feeding us and, and particularly our employees in the workforce and a sensitivity to their needs, uh, I see that as a trend. Uh, I think our ability to articulate the value of our industry and what we do in terms of benefit to larger society uh, has been, been um, much clearer uh, the last two years. I think that's a trend that will continue. I think the trend around, um, you know, contactless transactions. Uh, I think the trend towards retooling our package lines and being more aware of, of you know, uh, size and scale of packaging uh, certainly an issue front side for us. Um, and I think the trend for uh, make for continued investment in the food system, I would I would argue, is also uh, Going to continue, um, yeah. A lot of things. I think our, our system has changed, and I'm not sure that we understand its full implications yet um, about what that's going to look like. I, I think you're exactly right, it, and it looks like the major companies are believe the trend's going to continue too, because they're continuing investing in infrastructure, hire people to do this, do this sort of work, and so forth. So I think it's probably absolutely right that it's going to keep going post pandemic. One of the next questions was, um, what kind of support can agri-tech companies get from Penn State? And I, I assume this was, we assumed my team, that this was in regard to training uh, ag agronomy technicians and certified crop consultants. Uh, and Penn State does provide the training, but is often done by a case-by-case -case basis. So if, if you're interested in this, um, I'll encourage you to reach out to Chris Hauser, and I'll put his contact details in the chat as well. Um, and the next big question we had was, what's the status of, um, oh, sorry, I'll come back to that one. One person said they're curious about sustainable indoor agriculture movement in the state. How do you feel about indoor ag, Secretary? Yeah, it, it, uh, I, I continue to be impressed by it. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, a little more sensitive having had this conversation with our mushroom growers who are who remind me that they've been indoor agriculture forever. Uh, so uh, we, we've certainly been supportive of, of them and will continue to. Uh, we have entertained a lot of conversations here in the department in the state with those who are in the uh, uh, confined environment agriculture. I think it's gonna grow. We're particularly well uh, situated for that. I think that's part of the appeal given our transportation infrastructure and proximity in the North, Northeast Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, I am amazed at the amount of money that's chasing some of these operations and investor interest in it. Uh, the final point would be, I think long-term sustainability is going to be directly correlated to the, the diversity of the production, right? Uh, meaning it's got to move beyond simply the uh, leafy greens uh, for us to, to be competitive. And I, I, the economics here, uh, we, we all watch that very closely. And I think that's a piece that uh, the, the, these operations are not exempt from the basic economic principles. So we're gonna have to watch closely. I like them for what they do. I love the technology. I love the you know, opportunity it presents. I think we just have to keep widening that wheelbase of, uh, you know, of, of product offering and, uh, uh, and, and be strategic about where those opportunities uh, geographically are presented, because I do think they lend themselves well to some of our urban centers. We're seeing them there, but I think strategy would be placing them there and putting them in uh, into these places that um, allow us for economic opportunity, job, workforce reinforcement, but also, of course, basic nutrition. 
I don't think, Secretary, we've ever had a conversation about this specifically, but we're, bo we're both on the same page. I think it, it, it seems like an area that has got a, um, a lot of potential for high value crops, herbs, leafy greens, serving um, restaurants, especially elite restaurants. But um, when you pencil it out for, you know, there's something, there's something about cost when it's still cheaper to um, import vegetables from California and Arizona than to produce them locally. And it says something about the economics of relying on sunlight and so forth and trying to do something inside a building. So it's got lots of potential, but there are, I, I agree with you, there are challenges there. I don't think it'll replace a lot of the other things we have to do, which, um, you know, out, outdoor plastic houses and so forth to get some of the vegetable production going in a broader time period of the season would probably be another thing we ought to be looking at more intensely. Yeah, so I think- Dana, Dana, if I could mention just one other thought, sure. that is, that I think if you look at the, the plant protein uh, diets, right? I mean, you continue to see you know, plant, uh, plant protein uh, everywhere. And, and to me, I guess I'm thinking out loud that it's, it's both what we have traditionally viewed as the leafy greens and, and the veggie categories. But I think those uh, facilities also lend themselves to plant protein production. Um, that uh, uh, is something that you know, we need to look at and be aware of, of what the types of investments that, that that's needed there, but also uh, how that fits into the plant protein consumption trend that we also see. So one of the questions um, was directed at me, what's the status of agriculture in Northwest Pennsylvania compared to the rest of the state? I feel extension services are receding and are not able to help new farmers in the area. Well, I've talked to this over the team and we don't think there's actually been a reduction of support for extension in those areas. We've restructured so that we have specialists in areas that, that are not just based in individual counties. But as I alluded to earlier in talking about where I see the future of agriculture going, I think um, vegetable production in, in, well, particularly across the state has got a lot of potential, including the Northwest as we see climate change. So it's certainly on my radar that we need to be continue to support that um, as much as we can. And I, because, I mean, the food baskets for vegetables for the United States for a long time have been California, Arizona, Texas, and so forth. And California and Arizona are, are it's just, it's inescapable that the, the water supplies they've they had access to in the future are not likely to be around for the next decade. So um, it's, it's, it's why I talk about it as an opportunity and obligation for us to, to try to do more. And I think we need to have more conversations about how to do this strategically. It's not going to happen just because we say it's a good idea. There's, it, it takes work to make these things go. So it's something we want to work on more in the future. Um, we had a couple of uh, co comments into the uh, chat, um, particularly about farmers markets and the, um, the, how important they would be in food deserts and how many farmers are within um, driving distance of South Philly. I, I personally am very enthusiastic about um, farmers markets. Um, I've had family members in, who've helped establish them uh, over the decades. Um, what do you think, Secretary? Is there a way we can do what we can do to build more farmers markets in around Food desert, so that some initiatives we should be taking a crack at. Yeah, I, again, I, I'm uh, pleased with what is happening. I, I, I don't think we're completely tapped out in in terms of opportunity there with with farm markets, uh, particularly grower only markets. I mean, they're, they're the ones I like particularly, and I realize there's always a, you know, there's equilibrium here of both access to food and nutrition, but also economic opportunity. So making sure that we can, to the extent we can you know, marry that up to the farmer. Uh, and I think that's partly, uh, you know, an underlying question here is the opportunity for agriculture. Whatever we can do to make that more economically sustainable, right? <laughs> so if that's the farmer's market and that's the best way to do that, then by all means, we, we should do it. Um, I think there's, uh, there's also need for, uh, to get into these uh, areas with, that are food deserts, true food and, and very difficult food deserts. Uh, we need all the help we can get, but I can tell you that the the response from the legislature and the community is overwhelming to uh, to want to help there. And I think that's where the farm bill opens uh, up opportunity for us. It's where extension and the reach of extension and the you know uh, all of the uh, educators uh, programming are are critical there but also where I hope that some of the investment 
uh, the ARP dollars and infrastructure monies and some of the things that were uh, a question at the beginning of our program could also be applied. Uh, we know that you know, based on the response we've had to the fresh fruit financing initiative that we we did during uh, COVID, the CARES Act funding, that there there's a lot of need inside of these communities to include uh, farmers markets and uh, would, would love to have that conversation with those who are raised that question, but also Dean with you and your team about what more we can do as we look at the overlays of both where production's occurring, uh, where the needs are in the farmers markets, but also where in our urban centers we can help facilitate that production. And we've seen a lot of amazing work uh, across the state uh, through our urban ag program and otherwise. So I think there's, there's a need there. I think the time is right to talk about it. Uh, and it's one of the, the uh, sustained changes coming out of COVID uh, is that that desire for uh, good nutrition, local fresh product is, is, uh, is only increased because of COVID. So, thank so you. Watch, so watch the space. We've, we've actually run out of time. Um, thank you very much, um, Secretary Redding. It's been great, another great exchange. Um, uh, for our audience, thank you for participating today. We're looking forward to having you join us on February 16th for our next College Connections, which will be on the science of winemaking and grape growing. And we'll all be joined by the College Wine and Grape team to discuss this. Take care. I hope you had a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.